Sidon, thank you so much for the opportunity to be here with you. And I wanted to start with that, that sense of what Swami taught me on the very, very, very first time I ever landed in Prashantinilium, which was in 1982. It happened to be the last day of the 10-day Dasara festival. Uh, all the pomp and ceremony was there. And we were in the Pornachandra Auditorium. And Swami gave a talk, and I believe it was uh, Mr. Kasturi, who was the translator, but my ear was not tuned to the Indian accent, and I didn't really understand much except for one thing. And that one thing was, Swami said, when you realize God inside and you go inside to who you really are, the closer to God you become and the closer that your will blends with the divine will. Now, I was raised with a Christian tradition that taught that God is out there and that the more I went into myself as a selfish person, the further from God I became. And this message just looks like the 21st blow on the rock that just broke something open in me. And when the whole talk was over and I was still ruminating on the, the more I go into who I am in myself, the closer to God I become and the closer that my will then is subsumed by God's will. Had me dizzy. Literally, there was a tree right outside the corner of Chandra. When I walked out, I had to go hug that tree for a while uh, just to get grounded. But that started me in a certain way on a spiritual journey that it picked up from ever since high school for 20 years before that. I had been going on an annual retreat of some sort, just saying, how is my life going? And this became the this, this spurring for me to take that annual retreat there with Swami. This was 1982. And what, what I'd like to share with you today is from that point forward, what has been learning me? Now, that's different from what am I learning. What's learning me is something inside of me that keeps activating He's activating the wish for the direct experience of what Swami says about who he is, who we are, and what is our nature as divine love. So exploring, not because I'm pursuing it, but it's almost like pursuing me to find out how is divine love our identity, our source, our journey, and our destination here in life. And I want to use the word grok here, by the way. Grok is a word in the English language that was invented about 60 years ago, 70 years ago by Robert Heinlein, who is the um, science fiction author of Stranger in a Strange Land. And to grok means to not just understand something, like it's a bookish knowledge or something we read or something Swami has said, but to grok, even in the uh, dictionary now, is defined as understanding something profoundly and intuitively, intimately and completely by empathy and rapport you actually then step into its reality so that you're touched by whatever that is that you're learning. You experience it directly and it actually becomes a part of you. And that is the journey I wanna to talk to you about today. And with the culmination on the question of what is beyond Swami. Right. Now, Let this, we should probably talk about that journey and mm -hmm. uh, think about when your first arrival in India and listening to Baba, what was it that really moved you spiritually upon your first meeting with Baba? Mm -hmm. Well, I'll, its first movement was that hugging a tree. And because I didn't know, I mean, the, literally I came there alone. I was by myself. I had only known about Swami for about eight weeks before that. I just showed up. And so I was I hardly even had visited a Sai Center. So I was very novice and, and my eyes were wide open. What am I going to experience here? And to be kind of shocked like that right at the beginning of something that had been fundamental the way I used to conceive of myself as a male who was hedonistic, selfish, and environmentally destructive. It's actually the ways I thought about it as a high schooler. That I could feel that this was a place he was going to move me beyond that. And one of the ways he did that as I started reading was to understand, he talked about, for example, uh, the, in the story of Jesus's birth, the three wise men. And he would say, 
Now, the three wise men, the first said to Mary at, upon Jesus's birth, you know, Mary, your son will be a love, of, will love God. And the second wise man said, Mary, your son will be loved by God. The third said, Mary, God and your son are one. And Swami goes on to talk about how those are the three phases of our spiritual journey, going from that sense of duality where we feel separate from God, but we have a, a loving relationship to this kind of qualified non-dual relationship of we're in the family of God. And that in the final where there's a oneness with God. And I had found, by the way, those same phases, even in the work of uh, Christianistic John of the Cross, who I really found is one of the people who helped me understand a whole different version of Christianity. Going, he was a mystic that lived in Spain in the 16th century. He talked about the spiritual journey as being like putting a log on a roaring fire, campfire, for example. He says, at first, the log may be wet and, and not dry, and it hisses and sputters, and that's kind of like this phase where we're getting warmed up spiritually. He says, soon, or after a while, that log becomes a, bit a part of the fire. It's starting to eliminate a, or a, um, a, uh, illumine with a few flames, but it's still dependent upon that fire. And he says, that's the second phase. And the third phase is when the log has been so consumed by the fire that it is now part of the fire itself. You cannot distinguish it. And so I became aware of this sense of moving from the dualism, which is a personal relationship with Swami, to more of a qualified non-dual, which is, to me, in my journey, seeing Swami in all, to the full non-dualism, which is a oneness beyond the specific name and the specific form. And so and I'd like to just say one thing about how that journey has been very quickly for me, that I tend to get glimpses of what this is all about. It's almost like getting trailers for the movie and I'm not actually attending the movie yet. And in one example, I was in Darshan in Whitefield um, somewhere in the later 80, 1980s. And you know, up until then, it was like, I wanted Swami's attention. I wanted to have a front row. I wanted to... Um, have him talk to me. I, would, I just, I wanted, I wanted, I wanted. It was a whole bundle of desires. And I read another piece by St. John of the Cross about, uh, it's called The Spiritual Canticle. It was uh, based upon an Old Testament book, The Song of Songs or The Song of Solomon, which talked about the marriage of the soul with the divine and how that marriage is consummated, which was really another analogy for this moving on to oneness. And it suddenly struck me in my heart, what if Swami were my spouse? How would I feel watching Darshan? Well, suddenly, as I tried that on, it was like I was not jealous for his attention. I was not eager to have him talk to me. I was in rejoicing in how many people had come to see this person who was my husband. And it was in that, that sense of the marriage I began to feel that kind of almost a qualified non-dual, if you will. It's like being part of the intimate family, being having intimate connection. And I realized that's where Swami was taking me, first of all, was being in the dualistic, which is wonderful, and I love it, and then being able to stretch a little bit further, and perhaps eventually stretch a little bit further than that, but more like making the three of those a dance rather than having to go stage by stage as if I don't ever return to the other. That can I move, and this has been my question, Greg, how can I learn how to move fluidly between a dualistic to a non-dualistic to a qualified non-dual, have those different ways of relating in my spiritual journey so that I'm not questioning or trying to measure where I am or how good I'm doing, but that I can just dance through these. Um, so that's that's basically the best I can say right now for the general tenor of my spiritual journey. And it's interesting you bring that up because I think you're talking a little bit about some of the things that probably keep a lot of folks stuck on their spiritual mm -hmm. journeys and they, they get to a certain point where they feel a little bit maybe blocked. And what advice would you give for sort of freeing people up to focus more on, on divinity itself? their own journey. Well, I tell you, it's always dangerous to ask advice. Um, 
And I, I think I'll, what I'll do is I'll share where I've been stuck. Uh, <laughs> so that uh, um, it really keeps me honest here. The, I see, I get stuck by, oh, five different things I've listed to myself. One is by my senses, my body identification, what my senses tell me and so on. Uh, my thoughts, the way language is constructed keeps me sometimes separate or stuck. Um, Self-image, um, how I see myself, I may get stuck there. And just the general sense of moving from fear to satisfaction and fear, how fear awakens in me. So let me share some of the examples of this. You know, I, I had the blessing um, to be able to teach at the university uh, in a master's degree program because my career is in business innovation. And so I was able to also sit on the veranda and be with the other faculty members and so on. And later on, that, you know, that continued. And during that time, I noticed how seeing Swami in the orange robe coming for darshan, talking to people, my senses are saying, I'm hearing something outside of me. I'm seeing something outside of me. Um, I'm touching something outside of me and so on. I'm hearing. And so the senses were convincing, very convincing in the case that Swami is separate from me. I see him over there, I'm over here, in spatial. And that when I went back to the USA, <clears throat> I sometimes tell Sai Centers, I said, you know, it's easier for me to tune in to Swami's omnipresence here in Dallas, Texas, than it is sometimes in Prashanti Nilia. Because I had to go search for it in my heart, I couldn't rely upon my outside senses. And so that's one of the ways in which I could get stuck in just having this kind of me and Swami dual kind of relationship. Um, another thing is about how language has done this. Like for example, Swami talks a lot about love, obviously, and you were uh, quoting him some there, which is beautiful. And I find that the way that I would be normally speaking about love <clears throat> is I love Swami. I love my wife, I love this job, I love, as if love had an object. And I remember when Matt Budgeon says, no reason for love, no season for love, no birth, no death. And I've meditated on that about how do I have love that has no reason and no season? Because normally I think of love as having the object of my love, a reason or a season, and that it is what's prompting me to feel love. Like if this person changes, I might not feel love for them anymore because I was in love. They, you know, what they were now doing doesn't prompt love in me, so I'm not loving. Whereas I found that what Swami was teaching and really all the wonderful masters and avatars have taught is that love is unconditional. The true love doesn't have a reason or a season. And so... I can feel love whether or not the person matches some expectation I have. But how do I do that? That's what's learning me. Um, you know, instead of saying that the, evo the objects actually cause my feeling of love, they might awaken it, they might evoke it, but they're just reminders of my own inner capacity to be love. And so that's one of the things. A couple of more pieces that I seen, I found myself getting stuck. One is, the use of adjectives, <laughs> things judging things as good or bad, right or wrong, dharmic, adharmic. Um, it's what the uh, in the Old Testament the tree of good and evil might represent, meaning the dualistic thinking, and that you'll judge things one way or the other, including ourselves. In fact, when Jesus said, "Judge and you shall be judged," I think he was referring to we'll actually end up judging ourselves and and in a sense hurting ourselves or holding us, our, ourselves down. And Swami says something interesting here. He says, by the way, if you do find that you're critical of yourself or even critical of others, he said, if there's any defect in your love, it should be removed only through love. And I really love that because my first tendency has been getting critical of myself. How could I be this way? Why don't I listen? Why haven't I followed Swami's words more? 
yada, yada, yada. But it's how I have to then turn to loving myself unconditionally is the only way to cure the defect of love. That's what Swami told me. And that was an awakening. There's something related that I just wanted to talk about. Um, one is how much we have almost a conditional self-love, meaning, you know, when we're born, let's just say we're totally whole, we're complete, but we learn over time that we don't measure up in some way. We're not behaving right. We're not good enough. We're not smart enough. We're not good looking enough. But there's basically a shaping us to feel I'm really not whole. I'm not really enough the way I am. And that I need to fill up and correct myself in some way. And yet, and, and I'll just say, you know, doing that means that I'm going to say, well, I'll be happy finally if I get this right job or if I get the right spouse or if I get Swami to look at me, I'll be okay. But we have this all sense of we're not really okay to start with. And yet Swami turns that on his head also. He says, you know, not only are you Atma, I mean, you are the divine itself, which doesn't have anything that needs correcting. But we forget that that's what he, um, or don't, you don't grok what he's trying to say there. But he did tell us this. He says, in terms of seeing yourself in everything else as love, he says, if you change your vision, the world will appear accordingly. He says, if you shape yourself as an embodiment of peace or love or reverence, then you actually see all as love. And so again, what's learning me is what does that mean? How do I start embodying that? How do I start feeling it from the inside out? It's nice words, but how do I take that in? The last thing that keeps us stuck, by the way, Greg, which is a little bit different, is what's part of what St. John of the Cross calls the, not, the uh, dark night of the soul. And, you know, that is where you might feel like a dry heart, you might feel lost, you might feel um, disenfranchised, whatever. And I remember one of his companions said, you know, I'm feeling this and I don't feel God's presence. And one of the things he says is, the fact that you can't feel God's presence doesn't mean God's presence isn't there. It's just simply that you're blocked from it. And the other part of this, besides the dark night, is that we can become complacent. We start feeling we have good meditations, we have good budgets, and we feel like, okay, we're, we've got it now, we're rolling. But then we get stuck there because we're not really ready to take the next step, which might be difficult. Uh, it'd be like, moving a baby from mother's milk to solid food, at first the baby doesn't really want to do that. And so at first we don't want to move on to something that's maybe more nourishing, but yet that's part of what God is doing, is sometimes taking away some of the delights that would keep us stuck. We start to feel barren, but it moves us into openness to the next phase. This happened one time with my wife. You know, she said, William, she came back from Darshan. She says, you know, I don't understand it. Mike. After being here, we, we lived there, remember, we moved there in the, 2000, the year 2000 and um, moved back to the USA in 2016. But during the early part of that, she said, I don't know why. I, I just feel my heart is dry. I, I don't feel connected. I just don't know what it is. And I said, oh, good. And she looked at me and she said, what do you mean by that? And I said, and I talked about what John of the Cross said. He says, you know, it could be that you're dry to the delights of where you had been. But now by taking those away, it's moving you to inquire deeper. What is your next step? And I find that is being so true for myself too. Um, it's told me there's always more ease to go. There's always more love to go. There's always continuing of the journey and just delight in the journey rather than feeling like I've made it or looking for some destination that makes me feel good. Yeah, you know, all of us, we're all at different parts of our own unique spiritual journeys. Mm -hmm. And from time to time, we come across different types of obstacles and, and things that slow us down. What would you yep. say is the most fundamental remedy that would free us all up for more effective spiritual growth? 
Now, from there, I want to tell a story of early on in my um, going to Prashanti Nilayam. So it was about three years after I'd first gone there. So about somewhere around 1985, 86, I guess it was. And as a Westerner, the whole thing of taking Padmanamaskar to touch Sai Baba's feet, or even just touching the elders' feet, was really foreign to me. I didn't know how to relate to that whatsoever. But it kind of grew on me, kind of wanted to do it. And so at one point, I, um, I was there, and this was the time before the uh, Kulant Hall was built, so we were on the sand. And because it was my last evening there, I was going to leave the next morning, I got the front row. And sure enough, Swami comes over, and he's standing right in front of me and talking to someone over my shoulder. Well, I said, this is my chance. So I leaned forward, put my hands on his feet, and he didn't move, and so I didn't move. I could have been there for 15 seconds. I have no idea. But, uh, I, you know, it was just like I was just dwelling in that. And then I felt his feet begin to move, so I pulled back very quickly. But he only moved about eight inches away. So I stretched out a little bit further and touched his feet again and sat there for maybe a five or ten seconds till he walked on. And some friends of mine there said, boy, you really got a blessing going home on this one, boy. And so I went home. I found once I got home, I didn't want to be vegetarian. I didn't want to do budgeons. I didn't want to read any spiritual literature, no matter who wrote it. I didn't want to meditate. I didn't want to do anything that had been my list of a good sadhana whatsoever. And I felt guilty. I was, I was going, you know what's William, how can you be this, uh, you know, um, just, I don't know, just, just you, you're throwing something away. Watch it. But I finally settled down enough, got quiet enough that I could listen to this as Swami inside my heart. I said, what is this about? Why am I doing this? <clears throat> and, excuse me. and he said, essentially, not in words, but this is the impression. Everything I had been doing was because that was on my checklist of how to be a holy person and a good spiritual seeker. I was supposed to meditate, supposed to be vegetarian, supposed to uh, do bhajans, supposed to read literature, supposed to you know, all that kind of stuff. And he was basically saying, I've taken all of that away so that you can start over. Because the only sadhana that's necessary is love. So if you're going to do bhajans, if you don't come out with more love, stop it. If you're going to do um, uh, namasmarana, if you don't come out with more love, stop it. And he went, went through almost like my list. Um, if, if you don't want to meditate, if, oh, if you meditate and don't come out with more love, stop it. He says, measure everything by love. Are you growing in divine love? And I later read a couple of things, uh, quotes from him that said exactly the same thing. He says, you do not need any special type of penance or meditation. Meditate on love. Live in love. Live with love. Move with love. Speak with love. Think with love and act with love. This is the best and most spiritual endeavor. And so I've taken that as both my medicine, but also as my food uh, ever since then. And I read further when he said, I was, well, what does this love mean? I mean, there's so many different definitions of love. And so I saw that what he said, for example, in one place, what is true love? It's pure. It's unselfish love towards all living beings. And it's considering them as embodies of the divine. And that such love is free from fear. In a sense, he said, divine love is changeless or unconditional. It's selfless and it's fearless. And that has, again, been what's really learning me over these years is how can I experience changeless, unconditional love with what's going on in the world or what's going on in family or what's going on in, in, within me, whereas I'm being more judgmental instead of being unconditionally loving. I love the way Jesus put it. He says, you know, the, uh, the Father uh, graces the just and the unjust. The sun shines on the just and the unjust. How can I be that way? And so, and, and Swami went further in teaching me this lesson here. He says, you know, God is love, full of love, the embodiment of love, the spender of love. God is where love is. And when one lives in love, 
He is living in God. And I started realizing more deeply that when he's talking about divine love, it is the nature of the journey. It is the destination. It is the source. And it is our identity. And what I began to do, by the way, Greg, was to, because the word God has such baggage for me, I replaced it with the word love. If God is love and love is God, then I can choose to uh, put those two words interchangeably. So I would, I would uh, read prayers and I would say, I pray to love. I ask love for this blessing. And it just changed the whole tenor of how I pursued this, uh, this path in some ways. And by the way, the same kind of statement is in uh, the New Testament with uh, Paul, St. Paul. He says, God is love. He who abides in love abides in God and God in him. And I saw that Swami was teaching the same thing, that since God is love, that if we abide in love, then God is abiding. We're actually, not only God is abiding in us and we're in him, we're experiencing the God nature of ourselves. That when we feel this unconditional love, that is the God nature being expressed and experienced. So that is what has really prompted me forward on this. Yeah. Now, let's take a look at the title of this talk, which is quite interesting. We haven't had a, a title like this before. What's Beyond Swami? You like to share with us what brought you to that title and what do you think is Beyond Swami? Tell you what, I just realized I've got a couple more things I wanted to say about the love piece before I get to that question, if that's okay. Sure. A couple more things that have come to my mind. Uh, I remember, you know, when Swami starts a, um, a discourse, he says, Prema Swarupala, embodiments of love, of divine love. So he sees us as divine embodiments that we're, we are that very divine nature. And so I could just as easily say, Greg is love, love is Greg, you know? Um, and so really, it's why he's also the difference between us and him, as you frequently said, is that we simply don't recognize our true self, our true nature that way. He says that, as you know, um, we're three people, the one we think we are, which is our body, our mind, our personality, the other's the one that others think we are, which is also our body, mind, and personality, and who we really are, which is at Atma, which is divine love. And so I've looked at that a little bit more and realized that um, one of the ways I don't experience myself that way is because when I, I've identified myself as my personality, you know, I've tried to, to cultivate myself as a good person, be kind in certain ways. But, you know, I have a different personality than my wife. I have different personality than my brothers, my bosses, things like that. When I've had to realize, wait a minute, if we are the divine spirit, that is actually beyond our personalities. I began to think of that, by the way, in, in terms of like, if each of us was a porch light, you know, it has a light bulb surrounded by a glass lantern of various designs and shapes and so on. And the glass lantern and design and shapes is that's like the personality, but the light bulb inside is the divine being that we each are. And so rather than identifying myself as the lantern, identify myself as the light that's inside. And that brings me back to the Jyoti meditation, by the way, it's a very powerful meditation to, to bring into this way of seeing things. And so what I then, I said this the other day to my wife, I said, you know, I'm starting to realize an implication of this. She said, what? I said, when it comes to unconditional love, personality quirks are irrelevant. The sun shines on the just and the unjust. I can love people not by being connected to their personality, but being connected to their hearts. And that the personality is just interesting at that point. Now, I'm going to say that very honestly, that that's a new thought. And it has maybe a one half of 1% penetration at this point. But it's something that's also learning me, is how do I suspend judgments or preferences 
and just learn how the light of who I am can shine irrespective of what's in front of me. It's no longer coming out because of the object is pulling it from me. Again, a beautiful sunset or whatever, but it's coming out of me because that is simply my being finally getting more and more opened and expressed. So, um, you know, and the last thing is that what I've just said um, is deep in the Christian tradition. I mentioned earlier about how my time with Swami has been a rehabilitation of my understanding of Jesus, Christian tradition, and everything that I grew up with. And I loved it when I read that Swami had said this. He says, be like Jesus. Jesus was a person whose only joy was in spreading divine love, offering divine love, receiving divine love, living on divine love. And he said, Jesus said, I am the light of the world. But then he turned around and said, and you are the light of the world. Greater works than mine you're going to do. He says, I'm in the Father and you're in me and I'm in you. You know, that we're interpenetrated. We are not separate the way I've been first taught. And I remember... Um, there was a professor at uh, Santa Clara University, Andre Delbeck, his name was, uh, and he gave me a book that about a, a person named Henri Lusseau. Henri Lusseau was a French Benedictine monk in the Catholic Church who came to India to set up a monastery in an ashram here in India, or in India, and um, he became so appreciative of what the Hindu religion had to say that could illuminate the Christian understanding, that uh, he actually changed his name. You know, um, the word Christ means the anointed one. And in Sanskrit, Abhishek is to anoint something. And so he took the name of Swami Abhishek Dananda, the bliss of the anointed one. So that was his Hindu Christian name, if you will. And what he said in one book was that if you look at the expression of Sat Chit Ananda, Sat being the pure being of God, Chit meaning the pure consciousness of God, and Ananda being the pure bliss or love or life of God. He says, those three words illuminate what Father, Son, and Holy Spirit means in the Holy Trinity of the Christian uh, conversation. Um, that the Father is the pure being, the Son is the, 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 and the Christ, if you will, is the pure consciousness, and the Holy Spirit is that pure bliss and love. But what he also saw and illuminated was that the Satchitananda talks about the transcendent divine, whereas the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit made that more personal because we love to have the feeling of wanting a relationship, a personal relationship, like we even love to have with Swami. And so... When Paul wrote that Christ is all and is in all, he's speaking to that sense of this consciousness, who we are, is all one with the divine consciousness. And so with all of that, thank you for allowing me to kind of uh, extend here, but all of that is what has kind of enriched my understanding where I wasn't having to learn something totally new. It was like finding the wisdom of what I had learned from a boy but had never been a parent in some way. So, um, and yeah, I'm not sure if there's something else you would like to add to that, but. Um, yeah, we, we do definitely have some more questions for you. And, okay, good. Uh, we, we want to talk about the book that yes. your wife put together, Love Blossoms uh -huh. from the Heart. And yes. we, we want to make also sure that we don't let you go without asking you about all those many interviews you've had with Baba, there must be mm -hmm. some experiences that really stand out that you often think of that you think, my goodness, that was amazing. And it really sits with you, but yep. um, you, whatever one you like uh, the most, but we, we should, we should cover those things for sure. Sure. Well, let, let me start there because, um, you know, I mentioned earlier that uh, you had also that uh, we lived in the Prashanti million for 16 years. And um, my wife and I were married in 1999, and, and we went to Prashanti Nilam. She'd never been to India before, so this was her first time. And we fell in love with wanting to just be there and actually to move there. And yet we didn't want to have to live outside the village. So 
Uh, she went back home to take care of some things and I was staying and wanted to ask Swami if we could have an apartment inside the ashram. So getting ready for that darshan, uh, I, even, <laughs> I even fasted for a couple of days just to put myself in a good spirit of uh, no, no desires. And so Swami did come by. I was in the front row and he came by and I asked him, Swami, can we have an apartment inside the, the ashram? <coughs> Excuse me. And he said, what? And I said, Swami, can we have an apartment inside the ashram so we can live here? He looked at me and I swear it was some of the most clear English, beautiful words I've ever heard. He said, but this is a mental hospital. Really like, do we really want to be inpatients at the mental hospital? Is that what we're asking for? And I said, yes. And he says, okay. And so he walked on. But two weeks later, we actually had been given the keys to, the, to an apartment. But I love um, the way that we had to see that being in the ashram was, I mean, it can be very intense there in some ways. And yet it was a, a blessing that we were volunteering for the hard stuff, if that's what it was going to take. If we had to go through some things that were difficult or uncomfortable or disturbing in our own growth, shedding some old skins, um, we were volunteers for that. And that was very, very much uh, a part of our life there, is to start with that. I'd say another, another situation was... Um, we were involved in a uh, particular lawsuit with someone in the USA. And this was really interesting because he ha we had about two or three interviews up front where we would go in, he'd take us into the interview, he would take us into the private room, and in a sense, he would stand there. He wouldn't even sit in his chair. We would stand there. We'd have like a business meeting. And he would say, okay, you, you could do this. Uh, your wife stays here, blah, blah, blah and was guiding us all the way through what to do with this. And, uh, and finally, the court decision came down and we lost. So we appealed and it went to the appellate court in, in the state and we lost that too. And we appealed to after the Supreme Court in the state and we lost that too. And so here we were, I had to go back to Swami and say, Swami, it's all done, we've lost completely. And he looked at me, and you know how sometimes when he's um, talking to people from overseas, he says, when are you leaving? Well, he looked at me, he says, well, when are you leaving? And I says, well, we're not leaving. We're just, we're here with you. Oh, okay. And he walks on. Only later did I realize that his question wasn't about leaving, leaving. It was about, okay, you followed my advice. You lost the court case. Are you going to give up on me now? Are you going to leave me now? And, um, and of course, we didn't want to do that, but we were still <laughs> questioning, well, how could, we thought Dharma was on our side, and how could we have lost this case? And <clears throat> one time, my wife, Deborah, um, pulled something down, a, a, a book out of the, our library, and it had a folded up newspaper clipping from what they called the speaking tree from the Tides of India. And the speaking tree, of course, is a column that's daily on the editorial page, but about some spiritual wisdom or spiritual story. Um, kind of a nice uh, break from the normal stuff that's in a newspaper. And this was cut nicely, folded nicely. She said, William, did you put this in here? Because I didn't. And said, I said, no, I've never seen that. And we have no idea where it came from. First of all, we don't clip newspaper stuff and we had never seen this story anyhow. But we read it and here's what the story was. This is Krishna and Arjun are disguised or walking as, as wandering sadhus. And they're a very hot day on the road. And they're walking and they come to a rich man's house. And they're very tired, very thirsty. And they ring the bell at the gate. And the attendant comes, what do you want? He says, well, sir, we're, we're wandering and we're hungry. We're tired. We're thirsty. What do you think this is? A rest house for some people? Get out of here, stop bothering us. And then the old man, I mean, the rich man comes to the window and says, what's going on there? And the attendant says, these people are just trying to get a free handout. 
And, he, and the, the rich man says, oh, send them on. So they're walking away. And after a little bit of time, Krishna says to Arjun, may the rich man's wealth multiply 10 times. Well, that didn't make much sense to Arjun, but he kept quiet. And pretty soon they came to a, um, the house of a very poor man, a man who only had one cow. And this man, when he saw them walking down the road, he ran out, bowed down, touched their feet, says, oh, sadhus, you look so tired and so worn and so, you must be hungry and thirsty. Please come from my, my humble abode and just get some refreshment. So they went there and the, man, uh, the old man um, milked his cow, brought some, some fresh milk. And when they were all rested and had been refreshed, Krishna and Arjun went off. As they're walking a little bit further, Krishna says, may the old man's cow die. Now, at this point, Arjun couldn't handle it. This is what the story told him. Couldn't handle it. He said, wait, 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 wait. The rich man throws us out, and you want his wealth to multiply 10 times. And the poor man does everything possible for our comfort, and you want his only cow to die. That makes no sense to me whatsoever. And um, Krishna says, that's very easy. He says, the rich man thinks that his wealth is the for, uh, is the um, uh, the giver of his comfort, his security, his happiness. When it multiplies 10 times, he'll discover that all that is tinsel, and he'll finally come to his senses to what really is the purpose of his life. For the poor man, for the old man, his cow is the only thread of attachment that he has left in life. And when that cow dies, he'll be liberated. Boy, that story taught us that we cannot judge what's going on here, what looks fair and unfair, and that God is on everyone's side to do what's necessary to have us all wake up. It may not look like that in here, but that's what's really going on. It really taught us an incredible lesson. And we're just so thankful to Swami to have guided us that way. Now, there's something else. <coughs> you know, by the way, that's where Swami, I think, encourages us to to sing that bhajan. I am God, I am God, I am no different from God. Not from ego identification, but from that consciousness of Atma that he is driving us towards and he's driving the chariot of us. You know, speaking of all this stuff with Darshan and, and uh, these kinds of uh, moments, I saw a video the other night. It was by um, uh, recording by Sanjay Mahalingam, who was a had been a student of mine actually when I was teaching at the university in the MBA program. He is now an assistant, associate or assistant professor at the, at the university. But he had a lot of time around Swami during all these last couple of decades. And he told a story on this video on YouTube that I wanted to share here, where he's, one time Swami had gone out for darshan and had basically come back into the interview room and, and Sanjay was there along with a couple of other boys. And Swami, he said, looked very forlorn and very sad. And he said, this is Swami speaking. He says, as I'm coming for darshan, as I'm moving in the Kuant Hall, all these people are following me. And he kind of went like this, like this. He says, after so many years, they're still thinking that there's something here, pointing to himself, that is not there. And... That is what I'm most taking away from my whole time with Swami, is that really Sai Baba is, he is one name and one form of the unspeakable divine among the trillions of names and forms, including us. The difference again is that we haven't woken up to who we are. Of course, he is fully awake to that, full to, to who we are as well as himself. And that this divinity is above us, below us, around us, in us. You know, I remember the very first interview I ever had with Swami, my wife. Um, he looked at me. You know how he normally would say, a God is above you, below you, in front of you, behind you, in you, and so on. <coughs> Excuse me. And all around you. He looked at me and he said the opposite. He says, you are above me, below me, in front of me, behind me. You are in me. 
And again, it just rearranges molecules in the brain, to tell you the truth. Um, because going back to the word grok, to really imbibe, to take that in and have it actually be a part of me is a lifelong kind of nurturing journey. But what I've learned is to begin to love that journey and not just quail, uh, dwell on what the destination is. <clears throat> and, you know, it's like moving in the direction, I'm gonna call this again, the dance of the duality, the non-duality and the qualified in between. That realizing that as our true self, we've never been anything different than divine love. And Swami has never been anyone different than us. Um, so he just invites us to wake up to that fact and not be stuck in a dualistic relationship with him. And so when I say beyond Swami, what I'm getting to in my own mind and how I try to communicate is when I'm thinking of Swami as someone separate from me, someone I have to... Um, see outside of myself, um, someone who I have to relate to from a distance, if you will, goes back to the, my awakening from that very first uh, inner, um, uh, discourse he gave. When, when I go back in deeper in myself, I won't find that I'm separate from God. And he invites us to wake up to that so that we don't hold Swami and get stuck with Swami just in the dualistic relationship. That's delicious, absolutely delicious. But we don't get stuck there. <clears throat> we move beyond Swami as this separate form in this separate name to where there's all names and all forms and we are all names and we are all forms. And there's, there's no difference there in that I have found that cultivating that sense of divine love and where if I feel a loving moment, <clears throat> I can now recognize that loving moment is my experience of my own divine nature. That is the God self experience right there. <clears throat> I may have one of those a month. Okay. That's the trailer. You know, I'm getting to the movie now. And so the beyond Swami is to allow ourselves to dance into the qualified new, dual, non-dual, and the non-dual. I talked to someone recently who says, you know, I don't really want to let go of being uh, a devotee in this kind of Swami's there and I'm here, and I pray to Swami there. I don't really want to let go because I don't want to miss the enjoyment I have. And I heard that, and I can feel that myself. But that's why I say the dance among them I can return to the dualistic, but I can also move to the non-dual. And how do I dance in between? That is my quest. That is what I wanted to share with you today, is that how Swami's been learning me. And I take comfort in one last quote I'd like to share, and then we can talk further, Greg. Um, but one last quote about what Swami says that kind of keeps me resting well at night, but also keeps me awake during the day. He says, in the divine path, there's no chance of failure. It is the path of love. When you give expression to your innate divinity, it takes the form of love. Liberation happens when you love every being so intensely that you are aware of only one. Soak your heart in love, then you attain, attain God soonest. So grow in love, expand that love, practice love, strengthen love, and finally become love and merge in the limitless love, which is God. Because love alone can reveal the divinity latent in all. Love is God. Live in love. Love, love. Become what you truly are, the embodiment of love. So that's where, uh, Greg, if you have some other questions you'd like me to talk about, wonderful. I think well, that was actually a perfect segue because we should just briefly close with a, if you could just uh, uh, talk a little bit about um, the book, Love Blossoms yes. from the Heart, because you've been, that, that was a quote, I believe, that came from that book. And yes. uh, 
we'll, we'll also put that up on the screen for everyone to see. If you just share with us a little bit about that. Sure. Well, you know, um, just after my wife and I married um, in 1999, um, we knew that Swami's 70th birthday was coming up. And I, my avocation is photography, especially nature and flower photography and macro photography. And the love bug was already deep inside of me as well. And so we worked together to put together a book called Love Blossoms from the Heart, in which there are 108 quotations about Swami speaking about different aspects of love. The um, aspects, for example, like um, what is divine love? How love is the basis of all spiritual paths. Love is the ultimate power. Love God with devotion. Uh, develop love daily. Uplift humanity with love and so on. And so we put 108 quotes with 108 pictures of flowers and um, put it in a small book that Swami was generous enough to actually sign. And um, that went out in, in, uh, at his 75th birthday. Uh, that book is available online and um, for free and uh, has a copyright that allows you to make copies of it if you wish. And so uh, this is where I've been drawing a lot of the quotes today for, about love. And it's a very rich, uh, just, it nourished me just to go through them again before this talk. So um, it's something to offer all of you and hopefully that will nourish you as well. well I think you have, and I think um, we'll, we'll wrap it up, but it, we, we should ask you once again, just to give us some last nourishing insights from your time with Baba. Sure. Uh, let me pause just for a moment. Um, I'll say something personal first, and that is, you know, my name is William, but my nickname was always Bill up until I came to Swami. And um, I heard Swami once uh, ask another person whose name was Bill, oh, what kind of Bill is you? are you? Are you an invoice? You know, do I have to pay you? And uh, that kind of woke me up a little bit. And I realized I had been, first of all, named after my grandfather. But I realized the name William had three different words to it. Will, I, am. And my journey has been in that, in that level, whose will am I being? Like I said, from that first tree hugging event, realizing that when Swami said, the closer you find God inside of you that you are, the more your ego will, let's just say, is subsumed by the divine will. And so my name actually became a reminder of whose will am I and to ask myself that constantly. Am I being God's will here or am I being what my ego wants? And that's one of those kind of inspirations that happens from Swami without his actually even saying anything directly to you. Um, when it comes to the interactions with Swami, I have found that... Um, his way of giving correction is loving and ultimate loving. Uh, I know that, for example, with my, um, in our very first interview, he asked my wife, and she tells this story so I can share it. He asked my wife, um, where's your husband? And she points to me right next to her, right there, it's funny. And she said, and he's a good man. He said, then why do you fight with him? Yes, no, yes, no. And we laughed about that afterwards too. And she said, well, it's so true. I, I argue with you all the time inside. I just don't always talk about it. Well, as Swami often does, he gives correction to people next to you that you also need for yourself. And uh, I have found I needed that same correction for myself. He just wasn't embarrassing me uh, with it. And, um, but he did do another time when I was in an interview. <clears throat> um, we were sitting in the outer interview room and he was taking a couple inside and um, he showed the couple through the, the curtain and then came back out and pointed a finger at me and says, just said the word jealous and then walked into the inner room to have that interview. And then those people came out and he took another couple in, but then he came back out for a second and looked at me and says, critical, <clears throat> critical. 
And I mean, I was kind of shaken at that point, but I realized I had never felt such a flow of love that he wasn't criticizing me. He was criticizing a personality habit. Something that is not me by nature. It is simply part of that personality of the mind that he says, we're not that mind in any of He wanted me just to clean up the house. And so what I'm really sharing here is that what may look like a downturn, may look like something being critical, look like a problem, a challenge, and you turn to Swami and say, why me? I always take comfort in the words that he has used many times, which says, your difficulties are for your good and for your protection. Now, the puzzle is, how is this good for my protection? And I have to sometimes go on faith for that. But that gives me the sense that, you know, he's in some ways a stern taskmaster. But in other ways, he's the loving mother. And when I keep that in mind, I'm able to flow with with whatever comes, you know, it's kind of like, like this, Greg. I realize that if you're asking Swami to be your guru or Satguru, you're hiring him for a job. And he's going to do that job as well as, you know, as the divine person can. If that means helping you get rid of a bad habit, that's his job. If it means having a difficulty, that's his job. Because you've hired him. He's got to keep that agreement. And so that allows me to understand that even if I have a difficulty to be thankful. Because that just shows Swami is, is up to his job. And when I hold it like that, I'm more open to what's the lesson here? Where's the love here? Where's the love flowing to me here? And how to even move beyond that feeling of, the separateness to realizing how the whole world is already love if I just change my view, if I just change the way that I'm seeing things. So thank you for this opportunity. Sai Ram. Yes, uh, I was very impressed with everything that you shared, in particular how even when you didn't get what you wanted through your surrender to God, you were convinced that you know you would win with the lawsuit. And Bob said, are you going to leave now? No, of course mm -hmm. not. I have surrendered and it, we, we stick with it. We keep working on it. That's, that's our job to keep working on it. So I would very much like to thank Mr. Miller Jay Sairam was an excellent talk, beautiful insights and experiences, and also helping us increase our joy.